Okay, so clearly people like Telltale's The Walking Dead. Actually, people love the game. Lee and Clementine's story connected with so many people, and social media was being stormed by people praising the game, while the game also received many Game of the Year awards from various websites. The Walking Dead revived the adventure game genre, and the game brought Telltale to be a top developer for the time. Well, with such an impressive community around the game, the question was, when is Season 2 coming? Like I said in the first video, Telltale's contract with Skybound was multi-titled, meaning that they were planning a whole series of Walking Dead games. People knew that a second season was eventually coming, and the community was undoubtedly excited, but first Telltale had something to throw in between the two games, the 400 Days DLC. I'm really not going to talk about this DLC at all, it takes about an hour to complete, and all it does is introduce a couple of characters that will pop up for like 2 seconds in Season 2. Despite how unimportant it ended up being, the fact that the characters would reappear in Season 2 was a big selling point for this DLC, and eventually the DLC was bundled with copies of the first game in the Game of the Year release. The only thing that you'd need to take away from the DLC is there's a character named Bonnie in it, and that's about it. Telltale had already announced that Season 2 was coming shortly after the first season, and eventually on October 29, 2013, the teaser trailer was put up on the Telltale Games YouTube channel. The trailer featured Clementine slightly older and seemingly alone, and it became common knowledge that the player would play as Clementine for this season. People were hyped, and the comments were filled with excitement and curiosity about what Clementine is going to go through as the trailer didn't show anything about the game. I think this random comment on the trailer from 8 years ago sums up what the general understanding about the game was. Telltale is also adamant that just because Clementine is a child and a fan favorite doesn't mean she gets a free pass from the cruel occurrences of the Walking Dead world. The thing that we repeat around the office is that the world doesn't give a crap if you're a little girl, Lenart says. Clementine isn't off the hook in the danger department, nor is she shielded from the realities of her world. Just as the comment says, Telltale developers had this mentality while creating the game that Clementine is a child and the world doesn't care. The story was clearly going to be harsh on Clementine and people couldn't wait to see what was going to happen. Now with that long intro out of the way, I want to put another short disclaimer at the beginning of this video here. This is my second retrospective video, so apologies if there are any mistakes in this video. This video is also going to be structured just a tad different from the previous one because I won't have to explain things that were already in the first video, such as the gameplay and Telltale's history. Also, I just want to thank you guys so much for the support on the first video. Um, I'm recording this afterwards because originally in my script it said thank you so much for 600 views on it. And uh, now it's at 13,000, so I don't think that applies too much anymore. But again, thank you so much, uh, and yeah. Also, final spoiler warning here, there will be a lot of spoilers throughout this video, and I highly recommend playing the game or watching a playthrough of it before watching this video, as the experience is much better blind. Great, with that out of the way, I want to talk about what's different in this game from the first season, since I already went over how the game works in my first video. Overall, The Walking Dead Season 2 really isn't that different. Some very slight changes were made with the Telltale tool that allowed for some minor improvements, but nothing was all too noticeable. Graphically, the game looks almost exactly the same. The only thing you can really notice is the characters' faces are a bit more naturally shaped and better looking overall. The gameplay has also had a slight improvement with the addition of movement arrows. On top of the previous quick time events such as spam pressing the buttons, there are arrows that will appear on your screen and you have to press the movement key in the direction the arrow is facing to complete the action. I think this is a great addition as it allows for things like chase scenes or sneaking. Another gameplay change is the very occasional hold click action. This rarely happens in the game but it requires the player to hold down click or whatever button on the controller and then press a movement option after you've held click for long enough. The HUD in this season also looks different, at least for PC players. Consoles have always had the radial speech options and cursor options since the first game, but PC had some janky controls in the first game like pressing numbers for the dialogue choices and scrolling to choose an action with the cursor. This was streamlined to have large boxes to pick the dialogue options, which I think looks really nice, and radial choices around the cursor that the player can click on to choose the action. 
The soundtrack is once again done by Jared Emerson Johnson, and he still does an excellent job. And yeah, I think that's pretty much everything new. Let's hop into the main attraction, the story. Right off the bat, the second season has a 9 month time skip from the first game. This episode is called Amid the Ruins because the only people that are here are the people that lived through the end of season 1. Clementine was able to escape from Savannah and meet up with Krista and Omid, something that was ambiguously shown in the post credit scene of the first game. Everything seems relatively well for the trio. Krista is pregnant, which again is something that was brought up in the first game and she's getting really close to having her baby. The group is talking and laughing as they approach a rest stop to clean up. While Clementine is basically still the same age as the first game, she is noticeably more mature with a bit more independence and she stays strapped. She almost sounds like she isn't as scared of the world anymore as she is tired of it, getting annoyed at things like the water from the sinks not working. Please have water. Figures. The player is controlling Clementine here and it's really cool to see her inner monologue like Lee in the first game. While Clementine is cleaning up, she hears somebody coming, so she hides in the stalls, unfortunately leaving her gun with her bag. A teenager enters the room and threatens Clementine at gunpoint for her stuff. Luckily, we got Omid on his sneak game, approaching the girl slowly to attack her, but he neglects to realize that doors close and make noise, and he gets shot. Okay, so we're 5 minutes in and we've killed a main character. Omid's death is sad to me because I always thought he was kind of funny and it happens so suddenly. Krissa bursts into the room and sees what happens to Omid and just no hesitation shoots this girl. 16 months later we cut to Clementine and Krista around a dying fire in the rain. Krista is surprisingly cold to Clem and it's because she internally blames Clementine for the death of Omid even though it wasn't something that she could have avoided. Krista obviously still cares about Clementine, but she can't shake off this feeling that Omid would still be alive if it wasn't for her. She wants Clementine to be able to light the fire by herself because she knows that Clem will need to know how to do it to survive. So clearly she does still care for Clem, but it's more difficult for her. Also they never mention what happens to Krista's baby, but there is a hint later on in the game that may give us an idea of what happened. The player has options to choose pictures out of Clementine's bag, featuring the picture of Lee from the first game and the drawing of Kenny's family. You can burn the Kenny drawing if you want, but even if you try to burn the Lee picture, Clem won't go through with it because she can't burn the last remnant of her apocalypse dad. While trying to light the fire, Clementine hears screaming out in the woods and she runs over to see that a group of bandits has surrounded Krista. They want Krista to tell them if anyone else is with her and what stuff she has, but she doesn't sell Clementine out. Clementine has the option to interfere and no matter what you choose, she ends up getting chased and this is where we get our first introduction to the movement arrows. I think that the movement arrows add a lot to the gameplay because while it is simple, it makes it feel a lot more intense than just watching the characters run with no player input. While Clementine is getting away, you hear a shot in the distance, which could have been at Krista, we don't really know. I really like how they still made Clementine incredibly vulnerable. She gets caught several times but her sheer determination helps her to get out. Clem is also shown to be pretty resourceful with her use of grabbing things around her and biting people to escape. Eventually, she rolls into a river while trying to get away and gets swept up in the current. Just like that, Clementine is completely alone for the first time. There have only been a few cases where she has been all alone, like at the beginning of the first game and at the end of the first game, but now she has to make do by herself. After wandering for a bit, Clementine finds an abandoned camp and she also finds a dog. This dog is friendly and kind of makes it feel like Clementine isn't alone because she has someone to vent her thoughts to. Think anyone's been sleeping in here? I can't tell. Maybe we'd better not wait around to find out. After a little exploration, Clem kills a walker to get a knife so that she can open her can of food. Even though this walker is pinned down, it still poses a threat to Clementine and she still has to put in a lot of effort to kill it. I also like how she tells the dog the same advice about walkers that Lee told her. It's okay. We're smart. He's not. We're smarter than all of them. Once Clementine opens the can of food, the dog attacks her for it and bites her arm pretty severely. The dog lands on a spike after Clementine kicks him off of her, and the player has to choose to mercy kill the dog or leave it there. Nobody likes killing dogs in video games, so the fact that this is Clem's reality just shows how dire her situation is. Walker starts swarming the camp that Clem's at, but luckily a couple of strangers pick her up and save her. Once they're saved, the two strangers introduce themselves as Pete and Luke, Pete being a natural leader and father figure, and Luke who is a nice guy who tries to help people when he can. 
No matter how nice Luke is, he still drops Clementine when he sees the bite on her arm. Hey, we got a doctor with us, and you look like you could use some- Oh, shit! Ah! What? What is it? She's- She's been bit, man. Fuck. Fuck, fuck, fuck. What are we gonna do here? It makes sense in this world that seeing any kind of bite would make you paranoid, and Clem insisting that it's a dog bite falls on deaf ears. Once Clementine passes out because of the dog bite, they decide to take her back to their group at a cabin, but things don't go too well when she wakes up. Her misery right there. Dog bite my ass. I need a dog. <gasps> this is Nick. He's basically the Ben for the season, and you can tell because he couldn't hit a shot right in front of him. Idiot! Every lurker for five miles probably heard You're the that. one telling me to fucking shoot her. Everybody just calm down. For this is Rebecca. She's pregnant and pretty mean. Whatever it was, it got you good. Carlos is a doctor who can't tell the difference between a dog bite and a human bite. Who's she? Sarah. What I say, stay inside. This is Sarah. She's extremely sheltered by her dad Carlos and hardly knows what's going on in the world. What about my arm? It needs to get cleaned and, and stitched and bandaged. The girl is in bad shape, Carlos. We have all that stuff inside the cabin. We could probably get by Alvin, with it. please. But yeah, we can't do nothing. This is Alvin. He does everything that Rebecca says. Alright, got all of those characters? Probably not, but I'll refer to them by name plenty so you'll know everybody eventually. The situation de-escalates slightly, and like I said, Carlos has no idea if it's a dog bite or a walker bite, so the group determines that by locking Clementine in a shed, they'll know by morning whether she was bitten or not. I guess you can't blame them for being cautious, but at the same time an 11 year old girl needs her arm stitched up and they're gonna let her bleed overnight, despite her pleas for help. Luckily, Clementine doesn't stand for that kind of stuff anymore, so she finds a hole to break out of the shed and sneaks into the house to grab any materials that she can use to stitch herself up. Getting into the house is one of the first examples of Clementine being able to utilize her size and wits to get things done. She's able to crawl underneath the house and break the lock with her knife, and just like that she's inside the house. The new group is holding a meeting in the kitchen about what to do with Clementine, which gives her the perfect opportunity to find the materials that she needs. She visits various rooms in the house and finds items such as cloth, fishing line to stitch herself up, and medicine to clean the wound. In one of the rooms she encounters Sarah, and Clementine is able to convince her to help get supplies. I wouldn't necessarily say that Clementine is manipulating here her, but you can basically say that you're friends so that she'll help. But the manipulation is for a good cause, so it's okay. Right? We can be best friends. I haven't met another girl my age since way before. It's hard to be the only girl, you know? Rebecca is okay, but she's old. And that's it. Yes, we are friends. She also encounters Rebecca, the pregnant lady, in the bathroom, and Clem overhears her mumbling to herself about who the father of her baby really is, which will come up again later. Clementine goes back to the shed and starts the grueling process of stitching herself back up. A lot of people say this goes on for too long, but to me that makes the player feel it just that much more. I wouldn't even be able to keep my hands steady here, and she is fully stitching herself up all by herself. And she's 11. Right after stitching herself, she gets attacked by a walker who crawled through the hole she made, and using her resources around her, she's able to kill it. Clem is pretty smart, so she uses things like long range tools to keep the walker at a distance and get it stuck on the anchor because she knows she doesn't have a chance facing it head on. When you take the walker down and the doors bust open with the group on the other side, you get one of the coolest dialogue options. I'm still not bitten. I never was. That almost didn't get left in the game, but luckily the developers fought for it, and for good reason, that line is cold. They finally decide that Clem isn't bitten, and let her inside the house to eat. We get to talk a little more with Luke, and he proves even more that he's a cool dude. It's refreshing to see a character that's a good person in a game without some kind of drawback or twist villain plot that seems to happen a lot nowadays. He asks Clementine about her life, and she answers with the travesties that happened in the first game, and she mentions Lee as a callback for the player. This man found me and took care of me. We met up with other survivors, and we all tried to make it, but it didn't work. His name was Lee. He taught me how to survive. Clem also gets an apology from Nick for almost killing her, showing that he isn't a bad person, he's just another idiot like Ben, and Rebecca comes over and bullies Clementine for stealing from the group. 
The next day, Clementine, Pete, and Nick go to check out some fishing traps at a lake and discover that a massacre of the group that attacked Clementine and Krista had occurred. The only people Pete and Nick know that could have taken a group of thugs like that is somebody named Carver, but they refuse to elaborate for Clementine. While inspecting the bodies, one of them ended up being a walker already and attacked Pete, and Clementine sees him get bit on the ankle. At the same time, Nick begins to be swarmed by lurkers from the noise the gunshot made. Oh, yeah, in this game, they call them lurkers, as a reference to what they're often referred to in the comics. Each season of this game series calls them something different, so be prepared for that in future videos. The player chooses to go to Nick or Pete, either helping the person who's still alive and well not to be hurt, or helping the hurt person to be able to get away. To me, I always found it pointless to go with Pete, considering he was already bitten, but I understand people wanting to help Pete, especially since he mentioned earlier in the episode that he knows people that have survived a bite after cutting off a limb. In both scenarios, you end up stuck in a small place, in Nick's case a moonshine shed, and in Pete's case a cigarette truck, and the adults panic and indulge in the items around them while Clem stays calm and waits. Also, Clem can take a sip of moonshine, which is pretty funny. Once you try to sneak out with whoever you're with, lurkers surround you and either Pete or Nick will sacrifice themselves to cause a distraction so Clem can't get away, and the episode ends there. Overall, I think this is an awesome first episode for the game. There are so many great things about it, such as Clementine being all alone and her stitching herself up. I think this is a great introduction to the troubles that Clem is going to endure throughout the game, and I would put it an 8.5 out of 10. Also, I do want to quickly mention that I gave the episodes in the first game a bit too low of a rating. I'd probably bump each of them up a half point, but I digress. I think this episode sets up a lot of interesting characters, but also leaves on a small cliffhanger that isn't too frustrating while also making the player want to keep playing. Episode 2 immediately picks up where the first one left off, with Clementine running back to the house. This episode is called A House Divided, in reference to Abraham Lincoln's quote, A house divided against itself cannot stand. Clem showing up has already caused some problems in the group, but the episode name is going to make more sense later on in the episode. Only Carlos and Rebecca are in the house when Clem arrives, and they explain that when they didn't come back from checking the traps, Luke and Alan went to go look for them. Once Clementine explains what happened, they leave immediately, with Carlos asking Clementine to look after Sarah while they're gone. When Clementine goes up to Sarah's room, she takes a picture of Clementine, then asks for a picture of herself, and I, I promise, this is important in just a second. Clem and Sarah get an opportunity to talk here, and Sarah knows that something is wrong even if Clem doesn't tell her. Sarah confesses to Clementine that she found a gun, and she wants to know how to use it so she can help out. If the player chooses to teach her, Clem gives some advice she learned from Lee, which is a nice touch. First, remember, it's just a thing. What does that mean? Um... I don't know. I thought it'd be heavier. Okay. What do I do? The most important thing is, always aim for the head. Okay. Sarah looks out the window and sees Luke walking back to the house, but after they go downstairs, Sarah realizes that it isn't Luke, but she thinks she knows who the person is, and if the person sees her, bad things will happen, leaving Clementine to deal with this stranger herself. No matter what you try to do, the man will barge in and begin talking to Clementine, asking questions about his people while also investigating the house. This is super tense the whole time because you can feel yourself being manipulated by him, and once he notices things like Carlo's shirt, things get more intense because he knows that the group stays at this house. Also, I really like how Clementine tries to match this dude's stance against the counter to try and act tough. Sarah makes too much noise going up the stairs, so the man goes up as well to investigate, eventually finding the picture that Sarah took of herself on the floor. At this point, the man clearly knows who Sarah is, and Clem has been lying this whole time, and he confronts her passively aggressing before letting himself out the door, but he doesn't find Sarah under the bed. You have no idea who these people are, do you? I don't know what you're talking about. Let me ask you this. When you met them, how much did they trust you? This is all done very well, and you can either be as helpful as possible or as rude as you like through the dialogue choices, but no matter what, you don't feel like you've won in the interaction. A little bit later, the rest of the group comes back with Nick with them, and Sarah immediately mentions that a man was here, and things get heated fast. Clementine, talk to him. And you just opened the door for him? Calm down, Rebecca. Calm down? I am calm. You calm down. I didn't open the door. He just came in. She's telling the truth. Did he say his name? Did he say what his name was? They explain what happens and that the man saw a picture of Sarah, and the group concludes that they have to move out of the house. Finally, Carlos tells Clementine that the man was William Carver, a dangerous man who held them at his camp before they were able to escape. Carver is still searching for the group to bring them back, and now that he's seen Clementine, it's best for her to stick with the group. 
If you tried to save Pete, the group leaves and first decides to look for him, only to find him torn apart. If you left Nick behind, he'll be found perfectly fine in the moonshine shed waiting to be found. Hey man, you got any aspirin? Nick, you asshole. They continue on in the forest and the game cuts to five days into the future. The group approaches a bridge that they need to cross, and Luke wants to take Clem across it to scout before the rest of the group comes. You gotta love how Luke doesn't baby Clementine. He understands that she's mature and can handle herself. Clementine should stay here. She's... She's what? She's just a little girl, Luke. She's a valuable little girl. I can do it. See? No problem. They fight some walkers on the bridge and have a close call, but they make it out fine. As they keep walking, they meet a man on the bridge who tells them that he has food and shelter on the other side of the bridge. He seems nice, but Nick runs down the bridge and points his gun at the guy. Luke tells him not to shoot, but Nick can't hear him, so he shoots the man in the neck and kills him. This is why I say he's a lot like Ben, just more deadly. He doesn't have bad intentions, but he does bad things. They call the whole group over the bridge and rest on the other side. Clem inspects a shed that they found and finds a knife that says WM on it, and again, this is important later on. They continue forward to a ski lodge, and Clementine climbs up a lift tower to scope out the bridge. When she turns around to talk to Luke to tell him she sees flashlights in the distance, Luke is running over to the rest of the group, who's in a standoff with strangers. The groups are arguing, and I think I just have to show you the clip for this one. Listen everyone, just stay calm. Who are you? Are you trying to rob us? Excuse me honey, but do I look like a fucking thief? Everyone calm down. Hey man, you calm the fuck down. Sarah, get behind just me. Just tell us who you are. We ain't here to rob nobody. Put the gun down, Fuck man. that! Whoa, 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 whoa. Please, just do what he says. Kenny! Wait, you know this guy? Clementine? I... I, I thought you were dead. Ah! Yes, they brought Kenny back! Everything about that was perfect. From the way that you can get small snippets of Kenny if you're observant and can even hear him speak before Clem pushes through the crowd to get to him. Also guys, somebody else was playing on my computer here which is why I didn't hit that hug Kenny button as fast as possible, otherwise you know I would've. Now I know what you might be thinking. Kenny died in the first game, you even said that in your previous video. And while yes, that may be true, it was just me being a little bit mischievous for the people that hadn't gotten to the second game yet. You notice in the first game they explicitly never say that Kenny dies, and Lee can even mention that he could have made it out of it, so while his survival isn't the most realistic thing, I don't put it outside the realms of possibility. Kenny and Clem's reuniting resolved most of the conflict between the group, outside of some distrust, but nevertheless Clem's new group is invited into the ski lodge. Kenny trusts Clem enough to put his weapon down by the door, which convinces everybody else to do the same. Right away, Kenny is a fun uncle to Clementine. But after we found this stuff in storage, we couldn't resist making an exception. What's funny? Oh, nothing, Walt. Clearly things have been going well for him since he found his new people. The duo get to have a great conversation, and again, Kenny just seems to be absolutely ecstatic. So who's in this new group with Kenny? Well, we have Sarita, Kenny's girlfriend, a teacher named Walter, and someone named Matthew who isn't at the house at this moment. The ski lodge is all decked out with Christmas decorations, and thanks to a wind turbine, they have power and even a fireplace for heat. Unfortunately, Carlos doesn't trust the new group and he wants to leave at dawn, despite the hospitality of the people at the ski lodge. While Kenny seems really giddy compared to how he was in the first game, we do get to see a glimpse of that manly man here and there. I got it, huh? I think I can manage, Ken. I said I got it. Always has to play the gentleman. But I'll tell you, when I met him, he couldn't lift a fly. Once it's time for dinner, the player gets a crazy choice. One of the hardest choices presented in any Walking Dead game ever. Whose table do you sit at for dinner? As simple as it may seem, this choice is actually really difficult. It's just like being at school and having to choose between two friends, and even though it doesn't have long-term consequences, you could hurt someone's feelings. Luke is really likable and nice, but we've known Kenny for a while, and there's still a lot to catch up on. Personally, I always sit with Kenny because I'm usually still hyped to see him, but it's still not an easy choice. Either way, whoever you don't sit with comes to the table you're at, and the niceties eventually fall through when an argument breaks out quickly. Kenny mentions going to Wellington, which is a fabled camp that Chris and Clementine were trying to get to while they were together. 
Nick thinks that a camp like that couldn't be real and sounds stupid, and Kenny is easily offended by this. Walt the Peacemaker comes by and convinces everybody to calm down, and Kenny accidentally asks Duck to pass him a can when he was actually talking to Clementine. Pass me that can, Duck. You can immediately see the pain in his face, and Walt decides to save Clem by bringing her with him outside to talk. Kenny follows them out, and outside they see a woman looking through the window. She says she's looking for food for her starving family, and Walt brings them out for her, despite Kenny being suspicious of her real motives. When Clem goes back inside, she gets called over by Luke, who shows her a picture of Walt with the friend Matthew that keeps being mentioned. It turns out Matthew is the person that Nick shot on the bridge, and the player chooses to tell Nick about it or keep it from him. Luke and Clem decide that they have to hide the knife that they found in the shed with the initials because it was Matthew's knife. Unfortunately, Walter already found the knife and was outside contemplating what to do next. Clementine goes to talk to him and this conversation can determine if Walter forgives Nick or not based on what you tell him. It's pretty tense and the conversation shows what happens when genuinely good people get pushed to the limit. This is a good man who knows the person that murdered his friend and he has to decide if he's going to let his anger take over him or not. Nick also walks in on the conversation and admits everything, but luckily the conversation ends when a storm causes the wind turbine to make excessive noise, leading walkers right towards the ski lodge. The group splits up to have a few people, including Clem, turn off the wind turbine and the rest to go fix the transformer that was overloaded. Walkers attack the ski lodge, and Clem quickly gets swarmed, shooting all of them that she can. Something cool is that Clementine isn't usually able to kill the walkers in one shot, usually missing one or two before she actually hits their head. This shows that her aim isn't as good as Lee's because she's still learning how to use her gun well. Every walker is a threat to Clementine, even just one lumbering towards her because they're taller and stronger than her. A minute later, Nick gets attacked by a walker, and depending on your choices with Walter, he'll either save Nick or leave him to die, and Nick can die if you weren't able to convince Walter that he's a good person. Luckily, Clem is able to get inside the ski lodge, but walkers suddenly start being sprayed down with a machine gun before it's revealed that Carver's group has caught up with Clem. The woman that Walter gave food to earlier is also a part of Carver's group, and it shows that being too nice is still a dangerous thing in the apocalypse. Luke, Alvin, Kenny, Rebecca, and Clem are all still hidden, and Carver takes Carlos to torture so that he can lure the rest of the group out. The player can leave their hiding spot to try and save Carlos, or sneak out of the lodge to find Kenny and Luke. Kenny takes a shot on one of Carver's guards and kills him, so Carver grabs Walt and shoots him with no remorse. It's too bad, because Walter was a fresh outlook on the apocalypse world, but he wouldn't be able to survive through his kindness. Carver then takes Alvin up to the chopping block, and if Clementine doesn't attempt to save him, Kenny will take the shot, and Carver will kill Alvin. If Clementine tries to help, Carver will grab her instead, and Kenny will surrender because he doesn't want to see her hurt. I find it interesting that a lot of people try to help Alvin, like, what is Clementine going to do but get herself in trouble? If you went to find Kenny originally, you get to convince him to shoot or not, and the same things will take place just with Clem on the other side of the scenario. I think this part of the episode is kind of cool because people truly experience this part differently with the side of the conflict that they're on. Either way, everybody is captured with Alvin and Nick being alive determined on the player's choices, and the episode ends with a close up on Clem worried about what's going to happen to them. Overall, this episode is pretty awesome. It starts out kind of slow, but it leads into a state of bliss when everything is going right at Ski Lodge. Once Walter finds the knife, things start unraveling, and the big conflict at the end of the episode ties everything off with a bow. I can't imagine waiting for episode 3 when this episode first came out. It leaves on a really good cliffhanger. I would give this episode an 8 out of 10, because while Kenny being in it is awesome, it's a bit slower than the first episode. The third episode has the group stuck inside of a container being taken to Carver's camp. Everybody has accepted this fate, except for Kenny, who wants to break out, but Carlos is arguing that it's just going to make things worse. Also, the group has no clue where Luke is, because he never got captured with the rest of them, and Kenny thinks that he abandoned them. This episode is called In Harm's Way, and I don't really think I have to explain this one. Eventually, Kenny finds a sharp piece of metal to cut his bindings on, but right as he stands up, the truck stops and he gets knocked out against the wall of the container. He gets his restraints put back on, and the group gets let out of the truck. Carver gives a speech over the PA system while the group is walking, and it shows how even though he's a madman, he wholeheartedly believes that he's building a safe community. Confused as to why we bring these people back when they left us as they did. I think I've got an idea. It might not come all at once, but time will heal these wounds. So 
I mean, it is a pretty safe community with plenty of food, it just requires a small amount of serious slave labor. The group gets into their outdoor containment area, which is basically just a fenced off outdoor area with some blankets laid out. They're greeted by somebody named Reggie, who apparently tried to escape with the rest of the group but didn't make it. Reggie has been trying to work his way up the ranks with Carver to atone for his escape attempt, so he's the supervisor for the returning group to make sure that they don't do anything bad. We also get a quick glimpse at Mike, who supposedly saved Reggie by cutting off his arm after he was bit working on fortifications, and this girl, who Reggie says is really weird. That girl is actually pretty important, just not yet. Also, Kenny has so many one-liners in this game, it's incredible. I mean, clearly he's already drank too much of the Kool-Aid. Kenny asks Clem to snoop around a little bit to possibly find anything that can help them escape. Just like Luke, Kenny treats Clementine as a normal person instead of a child, and the two decide that they have to try and escape since the rest of the group seems pretty hopeless. Kenny is always building Clementine's confidence throughout the season, and that's because he already knows that she's capable, and even if you didn't like Kenny in the first game, you can't deny the bond that the two already have from knowing each other for a while. In the morning, Carver calls everybody to a meeting and begins talking about their new life here, and he mentions a horde coming towards the camp. Meanwhile, Sarah starts whispering to Clementine while Carver is talking, and because of this, Carver wants Carlos to give Sarah a good hard slap. It's not like Carlos has any other choice, so he responds by smacking her ungodly hard. If you thought by now that maybe Carver had some shred of humanity, he basically proves his psychopathy here. Clem gets stationed to load magazines with Bonnie, who is the girl that tricked Walter into giving her food, and she was also a character in 400 Days. Bonnie seems pretty regretful for leading Carver to the rest of the group, and she says that she was also supposed to leave with the rest of the group when they escaped the first time. Bonnie is pretty nice to Clementine, which shows that not everybody that's with Carver is inherently a bad person, just people that are trying to survive. She even gives Clem a jacket that'll keep her warm, but the style definitely isn't all there. Think it might be for skiing. Had to wait for no one to be around to get it to you. I don't know. Oh, you don't like it. it it's not that. I thought it was kind of cute. Well, this ain't a fashion show. It'll keep you warm. Clem gets relocated to the greenhouse to trim berries from plants, and she gets paired with Sarah, who is so rattled from being slapped that she won't do any of the work out of fear of messing up. Reggie is supervising them, and he wants Clem to make sure that they do work so that he doesn't get in trouble. That was awkward. I won't do that again. I'm gonna go work now. The player gets the option to help Sarah cut her plants or work on their own, but Sarah is just too sad of a sight to not help out. I also want to point out the song that plays here. It's called Sarah's Song, and it's playing in the background right now. I think the song perfectly embodies Sarah's story. It's somber, but also calm, like she doesn't really know the true horrors that are happening in this world. It's so hard not to feel bad for Sarah, even if she is a little annoying. She was dealt the worst possible hand in surviving the zombie apocalypse through Carlos coddling her so much. Clem is 11 and Sarah is 15, yet Clementine has years more survival experience since Sarah's apocalypse experience has either been inside of Howe's hardware, which is Carver's camp, or in a log cabin not allowed to go outside. Once Carver comes into the greenhouse to check the progress, he notices that none of Clem's plants, or Sarah's plants depending on your choice, are done, and he blames Reggie for it. Even if Clementine tries to say that it's her fault, Carver is smart enough to tell when someone is trying to cover for someone else, and he shuts it down real fast. Explanation. We'll get it done. Just give us some more time. Just... It was my fault. I didn't show Sarah well enough. I guess. Nah, this ain't your fault. Carver has the girls leave the room so he can talk to Reggie, but clearly the conversation doesn't go too well. No, I gave no, you no, plenty no, of chances! Please, Bill! No! 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 Please! Ah! Weakness. Incompetence. It puts us all at risk, and it won't be tolerated. You think about that the next time you're asked to do something. After going back downstairs, Clem can tell Bonnie what happened, and if you do, Bonnie seems shocked that something like that would happen. Nevertheless, work needs to be done, so she sends Clem to take some nails to Kenny and Mike, who are fortifying a wall. Kenny and Mike don't seem to be getting along very well, and Walker's break into the store right afterwards, splitting up the trio. I think this is one of my favorite action sequences in the game. There are so many creative ways that Clementine kills the walkers here, and she used everything in her environment to keep herself alive. Whether it's killing them with a shelf, or knocking over one with a sledgehammer, or having one fall into the screwdriver, she is barely making it by the skin of her teeth until this guard Troy saves her and sends her right back to work. 
On the way out of that store, she's grabbed by somebody and brought into a comic shop, and this person ends up being Luke, who snuck into the camp. He's trying to find an escape route for the group, and he clearly hasn't had much sleep since the group got captured. He wants Clementine to try and steal a walkie-talkie so Luke can learn the patrol routes to find the best time for them to escape. On her way out of the store, Troy tells her that Carver specifically called her to his office. On the way up, Clem sees Rebecca crying, and once she walks into the office, she sees Alvin battered and bloody, knocked out cold. Of course, this is only if he's still alive at this point. See, at one point Rebecca must have been pretty high up in the hierarchy when they were at the camp the first time, and she must have been romantic with Carver at some point because he wholeheartedly believes that Rebecca's child is his, and this definitely explains why he hates Alvin. While Clem talks to Carver, Carver sees some kind of strength inside of Clementine, and he explains that Reggie had to die because of his weak will. Carver believes that he and Clementine aren't that different because of their strength. He plans to bring up his child similarly to be strong-willed and powerful so he has somebody to leave his community to. When Clementine returns to the containment, the rest of the group is deciding when to leave the camp, and a couple of plans start to form, using speakers to lead a herd to the group and escape through the herd, or wait for Luke to find the best time for the group to leave. The group knows that escaping through the herd would be a great distraction and opportunity for them to escape, but they have no idea how to get through the walkers until that weird girl from earlier comes with some help. She explains that by covering yourself in walker guts you can sneak through undetected, which is what Lee did in the first game to keep himself safe. When you cover yourself in their smell, rub the walker guts all over you. They can't tell you from one of them. Trust me, I've walked through herds before. It works. You just have to keep calm and make sure you're good and covered. You seem to know what you're talking about. This is nuts. I've done it too. What? It's how we got out of the marsh house. Lee covered me and we walked right through. Really? Holy shit. Oh, good one, Lee. The weird girl also explains that they can use a winch to raise somebody up a ladder to the roof, and they can drop into the building from a skylight. Unfortunately, the only person that can do it is Clementine because she's small, and Kenny pushes for her to do it since it's pretty much the group's only chance. Up on the roof, Clem overhears a conversation over a guard's walkie about the herd, and it is pretty interesting to listen to the guards sounding worried about what problems the herd is going to cause. Clem steals the radios without fail, and the group goes to sleep for the night with Kenny and the weird girl giving her some praise. Okay, I'm just gonna start calling her Jane since it says Jane will remember that when you talk to her. I don't think she ever properly introduces herself. When they're going to sleep, Kenny starts talking to Clem about Duck, and you can tell he still hasn't, and probably never will, fully recover from the death of his family. I thought about Duck today, about his dumb little face. First things that come to mind are always the dumb things he was doing. Kid was always running in circles. Every damn place he went, he just run. He couldn't stop him. Makes it harder to remember he was a good boy. The next morning, the group gets split up with just Kenny, Mike, and Clementine left behind. They have to decide who takes the walkie-talkie to Luke, and Kenny wants Clementine to do it. Unfortunately, the player doesn't have a choice, because Troy comes in while they're talking, and Kenny not so subtly tucks the radio in Clem's sweater pocket. Oh, you have your pockets all out. On the way to work, Bonnie pulls Clementine aside to talk to her, and tells her that she's starting to realize that Carver really is a bad person, and you can see her doubts about the job starting to show. She lets Clementine go back to meet up with Kenny and Mike again, and she takes the opportunity to give the radio to Luke, only to see an empty store. Troy catches her and takes her back to the containment area, and it appears that Luke has already been caught, ruining the plan for good. Carver wants the other walkie-talkie that was stolen, and the player gets to choose to fess up or not. No matter what you choose, Kenny takes the fall for it and grabs the radio from Clementine. Some people may say that Kenny was putting Clementine in danger by giving her the radio in the first place, but I think that Kenny really trusts her and that's why he wanted her to do it. When it actually comes to being in danger, he's the one that will take the fall for her to make sure that she doesn't get hurt. Kenny brings the radio up, but obviously Carver isn't going to let something like this slide. <laughs> Fucker. <gasps> no! Oh God! <gasps> Jesus Christ! Stop! Stop him! Somebody stop him! Troy! <laughs> There's a breach! Yeah, group morale is a bit low right now. At least Kenny getting his face beat in is enough to convince Bonnie to help the group leave that very night. Around sunset, the group reviews the plan while Carlos does his best to help Kenny recover. Carlos concludes that Kenny won't die, but the eye is destroyed and there's no telling whether the brain was injured or not. 
Another tough conversation is brought up from the cabin group. What should be done with Kenny? If Kenny doesn't wake up, how is the group going to leave that night? Luckily, we don't have to worry about that. Good. Because you won't have to. Say what you want about Kenny, this man never gives up. The group concludes that they have to leave as soon as possible, and they agree to rendezvous at Parker's Run, a civil war site near the camp. The group realizes that they need somebody to go to Carver's office and set off the PA system speakers to draw the horde towards them, and this next scene has to be one of my favorites in the game. Wait, wait, hold on. She's the plan? I'm gonna need a boost. The way everybody looks at Clementine is just gold. The group is done underestimating her, and she's already done something like this before, meaning it should be no problem for her to do it again. Clementine makes her way to the office, and if Alvin is alive, he'll be unconscious while Clem is turning on the PA system. Clementine is able to turn on the speakers, causing a panic in the camp, and Alvin gets out of his chair and grabs a gun to protect Clem in his last moments. When someone breaks into Carver's office, he gets shot instantly, but luckily he's able to shoot the guard coming in right afterwards, saving Clementine. When Clem leaves the office through the roof, she realizes that Carver caught the rest of the group and has them all at gunpoint, but Clementine sneaks through the rafters and jumps on him, which leads into the Kenny-Luke combo. Finally, the group has Carver at their disposal, and let's just say that Kenny intends to get some payback. The player can choose to have Clem stay and watch what Kenny does to him, and I choose to do it just to see the absolute obliteration of his face. It is an interesting choice though, because if you don't watch, Clem won't seem as tough, and you also don't get to see that well-deserved payback. But if you do watch, you prove Carver's point that their strong wills are similar. The fuck are you looking at, bitch? Don't act like you didn't love every second of- <laughs> God, Kenny is so cool. Everybody is outside waiting for a walker to gut so that they can use its guts to escape. They do get caught by Troy when they're about to leave, but luckily Jane handles it quickly. We talked about this. What? The fuck you talking about? I told you I wanted to get out. You said you'd help, then I'd help. Man, you smell really bad. You gotta get a bath before we- <laughs> The group begins walking through the horde, and things are going well until Sarah has a panic attack and Carlos gets shot from a stray bullet at a walker right afterward. Sarah's screams cause the walkers to notice the humans, and Clementine has to fight off a few of them. While continuing through the horde, Clem notices Sarita being bit on the hand by a zombie, and the player gets the choice to kill the walker or cut off her arm, and the episode ends after you make your decision. I actually love this choice. The first time I picked to cut the arm off because it was the only way she would ever be able to live, but looking back at it, that makes absolutely no sense. How is she going to make it through the rest of the walkers while she's bleeding out? I understand why people's first thought is to cut it off because I thought the same thing, but logically it makes more sense for them to get out of the horde, at least then she'll have more time to live instead of likely bleeding out in the horde. If you played these games right when they came out, you would have to wait a couple of months before finding out what happens next, which is absolutely crazy since this is such a cliffhanger. This episode is honestly great. Just like most of the episodes, it starts out kinda slow, but Carver's camp is such a cool environment and you get a big feeling of imprisonment while here that makes you want to escape even more. Carver is an incredible villain. The best villains are the ones who believe their cause is just and they will do anything to get to their ideal world. Carver's camp is a good idea, a place with plenty of food and safety and all it takes in return is some labor, but what Carver neglects to understand is that you can't hold people against their will or they will revolt. Carver's camp could have worked under another leader, but his dictator traits were too much and it eventually led to the downfall of everything he worked for. Overall, the episode gets a 9 out of 10. There are so many great moments and basically everything from the beginning to the end of it fits really well together. The fourth episode is called Amid the Ruins, similar to the first episode where it's talking about the remainder of the group that made it through the escape. 
The episode picks up right where the third left off, with Sarita freaking out over her bite or the lack of her arm depending on what you chose. Kendall will either run up to bring Sarita with him, or watch her get devoured by walkers, then cry over her corpse while blaming Clementine for cutting off the arm. She was bit. I had to do How it. fucking dare you, Clementine! Is it gonna go like this? Like I said, perhaps cutting off the arm isn't the most practical choice. Luke and Nick, if he's still alive, decide to run after Sarah, who ran away after seeing the death of her dad, and Nick gets shot in the shoulder, again if he's still alive. Clementine continues through the horde until she gets grabbed by Rebecca, who needs help getting through. They also bump into Jane, who tells them to suck it up and walk through, but Jane can't bring herself to leave them behind. It does speak to Jane's character that she isn't willing to walk ahead of them. It shows that even though she is quiet and independent, she does still have a soul. They grab a walker to hold in front of them as a distraction and walk through the rest of the horde. Once they're past the horde, Jane, Rebecca, and Clem continue walking to try and get to the rendezvous point, but Rebecca and Jane butt heads a little bit. It also seems like Rebecca is getting dangerously close to having her baby, so it's important that they make it to the meetup point as soon as possible so they can prepare for her giving birth. They eventually do arrive at Parker's Run, and the only people there are Mike, Bonnie, Kenny, and Sarita if she wasn't left in the horde. Kenny is going off the deep end a bit here. He's going through the death of another family member after already losing Katja and Duck in the first game. Bonnie and Mike send Clem to go talk to him to calm him down, but Kenny isn't having it. He knows that people are scared of him and that they don't know what to do with him. You think I don't know what y'all are whispering about over there? What's wrong with Kenny? Why is Kenny acting that way? Do you think Kenny's okay? It's all I hear from anyone anymore. I do think I prefer the fallout of cutting off Sarita's arm because of how much he blames Clementine for it. Kenny has always had protecting and respecting Clem in his mind, but quite frankly, the adult decision that Clem made to cut off the arm doesn't let Kenny say goodbye to his girlfriend. While she isn't responsible for her getting bit, she is partly responsible for her early death, which is why Kenny blames her. We've seen it happen before though, with Duck. When Duck was bitten, Kenny took it out on Lee, and now he's doing the same thing to Clementine. He does blame her either way though, despite how illogical it is because there's no way for Clem to stop her from getting bit. Could do. Because of you, Sarita is dead. And you're telling me you did all you could do. You think because you're a little girl, you can just get people killed and no one will care? That because you're sorry, it'll all magically go away? That's not how it works! The group decide that they need to look for Luke and Nick, so Jane and Clementine leave to search. On the walk there, Jane talks to Clementine warning her that the group is falling apart and that it might be better for her to be all on her own. She might be right, since it's easier to save yourself when you don't have to save somebody else, but on the other hand, there's nobody to save you when you need it. Jane wants to give Clementine some survival tips so when she does have to be on her own, she has a chance. While searching a few walkers, they see Sarah's glasses, which means that she has to be nearby. Right then, they hear Luke and Sarah screaming from a building, and they get closer to investigate. If Nick was still alive at this point, you see him as a walker stuck to the fence, and Clem puts him out of his misery. He tried to get away, but I guess he lost too much blood, and it's really quite a sad death because Nick never really got enough time in the limelight. While trying to get to the building Luke and Sarah are stuck in, Jane teaches Clementine a trick to killing walkers. You can kick their leg to knock them over, then stab their head, and the trick works perfectly for Clem because of her height. Clem and Jane make it into the house and block the door, and they see Luke inside. Sarah's in the other room in a complete breakdown, and she won't move no matter what the group says to her. The walkers start breaking in, and the group decides that the only way to break out is through the skylight. Clem has one last chance to convince Sarah to leave with them before they leave without her, and the only way that you can get her to go with you is by doing something her dad did to her in the last episode. I don't know if the slab is supposed to remind her of her dad, but it works if you do it, so Sarah can make it out with the rest of the group, or die in the mobile home. The group walks back to Parker's run, and Jane explains why she wanted to leave Sarah. Jane had a sister who had no will to survive, and Jane couldn't get her to survive because she didn't want to live. Sarah's situation was very similar, and this backstory explains Jane's loner personality. When they make it back to the makeshift camp, Kenny has gone to the recesses of a tent, hiding away from the rest of the group. Clem goes in to try and talk to him again, and if Sarita made it at this point, he put her out of her misery. Kenny talks about what it feels like to get beaten to death, and he basically admits that he wishes Carver had killed him. You know what it feels like to get beaten almost to death. Peaceful. It feels peaceful. It was like I was floating away, watching the whole thing happen to me. And then I woke up again, and nothing's changed. I'm 
still taking a beating every day. It seems at this point Kenny has finally realized that Sarita's death wasn't Clem's fault and Kenny realizes that he has to step up once Rebecca's water breaks. Kenny is the only one that has any clue about the labor process since he had a family and he steps into his doctor role immediately trying to help how he can. The group decides to go on a couple expeditions to find water and a place for Rebecca to have her baby. With Jane, Clems find a gift shop that seems suitable for the birth, but while they're there they meet a Russian kid named Arvo who puts them at gunpoint. They disarm him and search his backpack to see a lot of medicine that could really help Rebecca with her birth. Clem can decide to keep the medicine or return it since he swears the medicine is for his sick sister. No matter if you steal from him or not, afterwards they let him leave. Luke meets up with them at the observation deck and he decides to help Jane try to open the locked gate that would be a perfect place for Rebecca to have her baby. Clem returns to the camp and goes on another expedition with Mike and Bonnie to find supplies. I should probably mention that these expeditions can be done in any order, but the same things happen either way. They do find some water inside of a closed ticket booth, and Clem can try to crawl through this little space here or have Bonnie try and reach the door handle, and I love Clem's reaction to being asked to do something that the adults can't do once again. That gap there. I could try to pry it open some more, but I don't know if that'll help much. Alright, alright. I'll go. Thanks, Clem. When they get back to the camp, they get attacked by a horde of walkers that are very close, which is strange because Luke was supposed to be keeping watch. They leave the gift shop for Rebecca to be able to have her baby, but the lurkers follow them there and start trying to get up the stairs. When they get to the deck, the group sees Luke and Jane cuddling after they, uh, you know. Well now we know why Luke wasn't keeping watch. They try to block the stairway with the decoy cannon, but it makes half of the deck collapse, causing Sarah to fall with it. Clem can tell Jane to try and go save Sarah, but Sarah's too stuck and she doesn't make it either way. I'm gonna be honest, this death really isn't that sad to me because she just had an opportunity to die and now she just died right after that. The group decides that the only way to keep walkers from climbing up the deck is to drop the other side of the deck as well, and once they do they're safe from the walkers since they're on the second floor. Finally, Rebecca's baby is born, and after a little trolling from the devs making us think it's a stillborn, it starts coughing and crying. It's kind of crazy that they were able to successfully have a baby in the zombie apocalypse, and Rebecca is clearly already in love with the baby. The other person that seems to be in love with the baby is Kenny. It's obvious that Kenny missed having a baby, and he offers to hold him when he can. While everybody's getting some rest, Jane decides that she's going to sneak out and leave the group because of how crazy things are, but Clem catches her and says goodbye. Luke finds out right afterwards, and he isn't too happy about it either. Jane left. For good. What? When? Just now. Are you serious? She didn't say anything about leaving to me? What the fuck? Kenny wants to leave right when the morning hits, but Luke thinks that Rebecca needs to rest for a little bit, and the player gets to choose what they think is best. They eventually leave the observation deck either way, and they have to walk through snow to try and get to a place that may have supplies. Rebecca seems to be completely running out of strength, so they stop to rest, but every little thing that gets brought up seems to make Kenny and Luke butt heads. Kenny says that he should hold Alvin while Rebecca rests, and Luke wants him to back off and stop being weird about the baby. Just little things like this start to tear the group apart. While they're resting, the group gets approached by Arvo, and he ends up surrounding the group with a group of his own. The Russian group wants to rob Clem's group if he took the pills or not, but obviously guns start going up as soon as this is proposed. While the argument is heating up, Clementine notices that Rebecca looks a little strange, and she finally realizes that Rebecca's turning into a walker. She must have died from too much blood loss, and Clem gets the choice to shoot Rebecca or call for help in which Kenny will shoot Rebecca for her, but this shot begins the battle between her group and the Russians, ending the episode. Okay, so I'll admit, this is my least favorite episode of the game. I do believe that there is some needed character development that happens, but it's just too slow. Nothing happens, and it only seems like a lot does because I'm going really in depth. The whole episode can basically be summed up with, they steal from a Russian kid, Rebecca has her baby, and they get attacked by the Russians at the end. Obviously more happens than just that, but it does seem like this is more of a filler episode than the others, so I'll probably give it a 7 out of 10. I do love how everybody starts questioning Kenny's sanity while the player gets to choose to defend his actions or agree that he may be losing his mind. Episode 5 is called No Going Back, because there's literally nowhere to go but forward. Clem hits the deck while bullets are flying through the air. She notices the baby on the ground, and the player chooses to try and grab the baby or take cover with Luke behind a wall. I try to be pretty unbiased with the choices here, but come on man, are you just gonna leave that baby on the ground? If you don't grab the baby, Luke does and gets shot in the leg, but if you do, Luke gets shot in the leg while switching positions, so it doesn't really matter. But again, grab the baby, man. 
Kenny is on the front lines here protecting his people. He really doesn't have much regard for his safety anymore. Iroh's sister was killed and he's over her dead body trying to give her CPR for some reason, so Kenny grabs him to use him as a human shield until Arvo breaks free leaving Kenny defenseless. Right before he gets pincushioned, the Russian with the AR is stabbed in the back of the neck and it's revealed to be Jane who did it. These people really are survivors, they got ambushed by another group and made it through with only a bullet in Mike's shoulder and a bullet in Luke's leg. Nobody died other than Rebecca and that was by natural causes. If these people can survive a whole ambush, they can survive anything. Kenny wants to finish off Arvo since he's the only survivor, but the others think it's pointless to kill him. Arvo says that he knows where a house with food is, and he offers to take him there in return for his survival. They tie him up and start trekking through the snow. On the walk, Jane explains that she regretted leaving, and she came back mostly for Clementine. While they're talking, Kenny's getting pretty mad at Arvo over the smallest things. Mike and Bonnie are surprisingly protective of Arvo because he's just a kid, but at the same time, he did lead the rest of his crew to the ambush, so Kenny's hatred of the kid isn't unwarranted either. I like how Luke starts getting pretty emotional when the group is taking a rest, and he kinda says what most people would be feeling in this scenario. Luke always tries to help people, but despite his efforts, his people have still died. How did we get here? We walked. At least most of us did. You basically had to be carried. Sitting in the snow. Lean up against a tree. Bullet in my leg. But alive. <laughs> when so many of my friends are dead. For no good reason. And I couldn't do anything to stop it. Everyone we set out with just gone. Nick, Pete, Alvin and Becca, Carlos, Sarah. And for what? They didn't die in vain. I wish I could believe that. I could have done more. And that ain't up for debate. I know it in my bones. And I gotta live with it. After that conversation, Clem goes to change Kenny's bandage and he starts talking about what to name the baby. Kenny wants to go with Alvin Jr. in respect to his father, and you can't get over how much Kenny gushes over Alvin. We finally get to see Kenny's eye after all of this, and while it is messed up, it could, it could be worse. I have to mention that I love the variation in the dialogue choices throughout this entire game. When Clem is about to put disinfectant on Kenny's eye, she has three choices. This might sting a little, don't be a baby, or this will hurt like hell. This might sting a little is her mature and kind option, because it's definitely going to sting more than a little. Don't be a baby is her childish response option, not something a kid would say to another kid that doesn't want to go down the big water slide. This'll hurt like hell is her teenager bit shining through. Her cursing is her trying to sound tough and act like she's an adult. This happens all throughout the game and you really get to choose the maturity of your Clementine, and I think it's the coolest part of this game. Clementine might be even better written than her in the first game because of the different paths you can have her take. Okay, sorry about that tangent, moving on. While his wound is being cleaned, Kenny talks about how he has to keep Alvin Jr. safe and make sure he comes up tough and smart. This line right here is super cold. Best thing you can do for Alvin and Rebecca is raise him right. Make sure he's safe. I intend to. Later, the group runs up on a power generator plant thing and Clem gets to hold AJ while they're scoping it out. This is the first Clem and AJ bonding moment, and I hate to spoil, but this baby is kind of important to the series, so it's cool to see them start a relationship. The group settles down in the fences to have a calm, quiet night, and I gotta say, this is my favorite things in games like this. Times that we see the characters just being people are a gem. Everybody is relaxed here and willing to share some information about themselves. Little things like Luke majoring in art history and Kenny's response to it. That's cool. Sounds like you majored in working in a coffee shop. Pretty much. Really makes it feel like people having a genuine conversation, and not just characters that have to progress a story. Nobody is immune to the magic of the calm night. Even Jane is convinced to join the group by the fire. Also, Clem gets the option to take another drink here, but I think most people are far too protective to let her do that. I also think that the characters gain some appreciation for Kenny, since he decides to keep watch away from the warm fire. If you talk to him, he reminisces about his family and how much he'd give to see them again. He also says how he's sorry about how he acted about Sarita's death, and he sounds so genuinely apologetic. I'm sorry guys, I try not to sound like a pure Kenny fan, but this man feels the most human out of anybody in the games. You can't really fault him for most of his actions. The next day they continue their walk, and finally they approach the house that Arvo was talking about. A half-built house that's on the other side of a frozen lake. They start walking across, but once the group realizes that there's a bunch of walkers following them, Arvo takes the chance to run for it, leading to Kenny chasing him and Mike chasing Kenny. Once Clem turns back around, she sees that the ice is cracking underneath Luke. Luke wants Clem to cover him from the walkers behind him, 
but Bonnie wants Clem to try and approach Luke to help him. Trying to help him is just a bad idea, the weight on the ice is going to cause it to completely fall through, so covering him is the better option. Unfortunately, if you don't try to help him, Bonnie will, and she'll cause the ice to break. If you go to help him, the ice will also break. Wow, Bonnie, it's almost like if we just covered him, the ice wouldn't have broken at all. That's crazy. In both scenarios, you have an opportunity to fall into the water, and I have to say, I like what happens more when you try to help him. Clem will fall through the ice, and while she's trying to get back up, a walker will try to grab her, but Luke grabs it and saves her before he gets taken down to the bottom of the lake with the walker. At least in that version, he saves Clem. If you cover him when you fall in the water, he already drowned. I can't believe they killed Luke, man. He was a great character that's been with us since the very start. I think this is supposed to be our Kenny death from the first game. A character from the beginning of the game dies in a scenario that shouldn't have happened in the first place. People say that Luke's death is sudden and kinda dumb, but I actually like it because people fall through lakes like this all of the time in real life, and we know that it only recently started snowing meaning the ice wouldn't be very thick yet. It is sudden, but sometimes these scenarios deal you a bad hand and there's nothing you can do about it. Well. Rest in peace, Luke. You were the best character in this entire game. Aside from Kenny and Clem. When Clem falls in the water, Jane's able to pull her out, and they put her next to the fireplace to save her. Kenny blames Arvo for making them cross the ice just to bring them to a half-built house with no supplies, and he starts beating him up. Fuck you. You fucking commie piece of shit, Kenny! You mother! <laughs> fuck you! <laughs> fuck, Kenny! <laughs> shit! Shit! <laughs> Get the fuck off of me! Well, it turns out there was food in the house, meaning Arvo wasn't lying, and Kenny beat him up for no reason. I didn't feel bad for Arvo the whole time until this moment. You have to get punched really hard to get that purple on your cheeks. To me, it doesn't even seem like Clementine has the strength to care here. I know I wouldn't if I was frozen like that. Clem goes to sleep and wakes up later to Jane sitting by her. Jane expresses that she's experienced a lot of death, but she says that Luke's death in particular was really hard on her, and she knew coming back would cause something like this to happen. Clem goes outside to see that Kenny's working on a truck, and the more that you talk to him, the more you realize his actions are based around Clementine and AJ. If you call him out about Arvo, he promises that it won't happen again because Clem doesn't like it. Oh, she was running her mouth. You shouldn't have done that to Arvo. I know. I know, Clem, but, but Luke- I don't care. You can't do that. Jesus, Clem. You know me. You know I'm not like that. You scared me. You scared all of us, Kenny. It won't happen again. That's a promise. The truck isn't quite working yet, but Kenny says once they get it working, he wants to find Wellington. He keeps working on it, and Clem sits by Bonnie on the porch. Bonnie's attitude towards Clem completely changes if you cover Luke instead of trying to walk towards him. She'll be rude and blame Clementine completely, which is just horribly unfair since it is her fault. This is exactly what Kenny did with Sarita, so how can Bonnie dislike Kenny so much and then do the exact same thing? If you did try to approach Luke, she'll act totally different just because you did what she wanted you to do. It's pretty hypocritical. When Clem goes back inside the house, Jane starts warning her against Kenny because she believes that he's dangerous, and pretty much everyone else in the group thinks so as well. Kenny's able to get the truck working finally, and the group starts arguing about where to go with it. Half the group wants to go south to get out of the snow, but Kenny wants to go farther north to find Wellington. The argument dies down for a moment and Clem and Kenny get to have another conversation sitting in the truck. This is basically your opportunity to agree with Kenny or disagree with him. He says some things that make a lot of sense, how he's all doing it for AJ and Clem and how Wellington has to be real because of all the rumors about it. Eventually the group sleeps through the night and Clem randomly wakes up early only to leave the house and discover Mike, Bonnie, and Arvo stealing the truck and all of their supplies trying to leave. Obviously, Clem brings out the gun because she isn't going to let that slide, but Mike tries to approach her and take the gun out of her hands. At this point, the player can choose to yell out for Kenny and Jane or to threaten Mike to stay back, but at the end of the altercation, Arvo shoots Clementine. Give me the gun, okay? Kenny! Jane! Help! They're robbing us! I swear, when I saw this for the first time, it was insanely shocking. I never expected something like that to happen. Things have gone so downhill for this group the whole time. There used to be so many people, and now it's only six. No, I'm not counting Arvo, he doesn't count as part of the group. Nobody from the cabin group at the beginning of the game is still alive, and it shows how much the group dwindles over the course of the game. Oh, and I have to mention this faker, Bonnie. 
If you tried to save Luke by walking over the ice, once Clem gets shot, she'll say how she's so sorry and this wasn't supposed to happen. Do you know what happens if you try to cover Luke instead? She says, come on Mike, we have to go, just leave her. Dang, she pretended to be a friend all game just to leave her to bleed out when Clem didn't do one thing she wanted. Obviously when Clem gets shot, she passes out and we wake up to a pretty familiar sight. Yeah guys, the entirety of the season was a dream. No, not really, but this dream is still awesome. It's super cool to be able to talk to Lee from Clementine's perspective. It's also cool to see Lee try to make Clem feel better when you aren't controlling him. It's so obvious that Duck isn't going to survive, but he's still trying to comfort her despite Clem knowing what's actually happening. We don't know how this works yet. Maybe it's like a cold. His mom's a doctor. Maybe she can help him. It's not like a cold. No, it's probably not. I also like how Clem is talking in her season 2 voice instead of how she sounds in season 1. It makes it a bit more obvious that it's just a dream and you can never really fully go back. Nevertheless, it was great that Telltale included this little dream. It gets you out of the misery for just a moment and gives you a glimpse of happiness after everything horrible that has happened. Unfortunately, all good things come to an end and Clem wakes up to see Kenny and Jane in the front seats of the truck driving away. We don't really know what happened to Mike and Bonnie, and things aren't that much better in this truck since Kenny and Jane are arguing constantly. Jane is poking the bear that is Kenny, and Kenny is falling right into it, poking Jane right back. Is it with you? It's your family, right? Don't. It is, isn't it? I'm warning you, you little shit. You're just another type A asshole trying to save a bunch of dead people. They have to stop the truck suddenly when a bunch of cars are blocking their way, and Kenny gets out to check if the cars have diesel. Jane and Clem get another chance to talk alone in the car. The game is purposely putting you in situations to talk to Kenny and Jane alone to give them an opportunity to sway you towards their side. The final standoff is gonna be between Jane and Kenny, and you need to favor one over the other, which is why the game keeps putting Clementine in scenarios alone with each of them. I'll tell you right now, the game has multiple endings, and I'm gonna talk about each one of them one after another and say which ones are my favorite and least favorite, but back to the end of the story. Jane offers to leave right then and there and abandon Kenny, but it gets interrupted when Kenny's gunshots are heard through the blizzard and walkers start walking back towards the truck. Clementine, who's in the front seat, drives away, but since she doesn't know how to drive, they crash and Jane has AJ and she has to run away from walkers leaving Clem alone. This leads to a treacherous walk through the blizzard to try and find the nearby rest stop to rendezvous at. I like how the game leaves you wandering aimlessly here. It doesn't tell you exactly where to go because Clementine wouldn't know exactly where to go either. She slowly makes her way through the blizzard, shooting walkers on her way, and eventually she gets to the rest stop. When she makes it in, Kenny's already there, but there's no Jane in sight. Finally, Jane approaches the stop, but AJ isn't with her. Oh my god. He's... What are you saying? No. No! Not again. Not again. This line right here tells us everything we need to know about what happened to Krista's baby. It wasn't a stillborn or anything like that. It died in a similar way to how Clem believes AJ died now. Jane warns Clem to stay out of whatever happens and that she's about to see what Kenny really is. Kenny, thinking that AJ is dead, begins a fight with Jane, and while it first looks like to be another Arvo beatup, it turns into a fight where only one person is going to survive. Clem can try to intervene, but nothing works. These two adults are so focused on killing each other that they aren't paying attention to the fact that they are knocking Clementine around while she's trying to stop them. Finally, it's up to Clementine to make the final choice. Okay, so what you just saw there is Kenny killing Jane since Clem decides not to intervene. There's a lot to go through here, so we'll talk about each scenario, starting with not shooting Kenny. Right after he kills Jane, you get the option to just shoot Kenny right then and there, which is just ridiculous, so I don't think anybody actually chooses it. If you do end up doing it, Clem hears AJ crying in a car nearby, and it turns out that Jane hit him in there just to prove a point about Kenny. 
the ending cuts a week later and it's pretty much just her covering herself in guts to walk through a herd of walkers. It's pretty anticlimactic and probably my least favorite ending. What about if you shoot Kenny before he kills Jane? Well, Kenny doesn't die immediately and he gets some final words to Clem, saying that he let everybody down and that Clem made the right choice. His death here is so sad, he's still so nice to Clem despite her just shooting him. Jane explains to Clem that she hid AJ so she'd see Kenny as a monster and leave with her. Clem gets the option to leave Jane behind and go by herself, or go with Jane back to Carver's camp. If you leave Jane, you'll get the alone ending again, but if you go with her, you end up back at Carver's abandoned camp. Jane and Clem are approached in the camp by a small family wanting to be let in, and they can either let them in or make them leave. This one's also pretty anticlimactic, and feels kinda half-baked. Let's talk about the Kenny endings, because they are by far the best. I'm sorry, but it feels like they were prioritizing Kenny with these endings. They're the only ones that can make you cry, and the other ones seem pretty half-baked comparatively. If you don't shoot Kenny at all, after a moment you can hear a baby crying in the distance, and Clem finds AJ in the car, proving that Jane just put AJ in there to tick Kenny off to prove a point to Clem. Kenny tells Clem how much he cares for her and Alvin Jr. and that everything he does is to protect them, and they can either leave together to try and find Wellington, or Clem can leave Kenny behind and get the alone ending again. Well, if you stay with Kenny, nine days later walking through the snow, Kenny and Clem see some smoke in the distance, and we get some good old dad Kenny energy here. Come on, I'll race you to the top. <laughs> hey! <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Alvy, we got this. You cheated. At the top of the hill, they discover that they found Wellington and they approach the walls. When they get closer, the girl at the gate tells them that they aren't accepting any more people because of overpopulation in the walls, and the best that they can do is give them a bag of supplies to help them on their way. Kenny steps in and tells the guard to take the kids and just leave him behind. To me, I just take the kids. What? Please, just take the kids. It's too dangerous out here for them. Kenny, I. It's just a little girl and a baby boy. You can make room for that. You can take back the supplies you gave us if that helps. Please, just. I need them to be safe, and it's safe in there. I know that. Just ask someone, please. They won't make it out here. Please. The guard tells him that they can only take the children, and Kenny begs Clementine to take Alvin Jr. and live inside of Wellington. The player gets one last choice, to so stay at Wellington and leave Kenny behind, or leave Wellington together with Kenny. This is one of the hardest freaking decisions in any Telltale game for me. Yes, of course it's better for Clementine to stay at Wellington, but imagine if that was your mom or dad telling you to leave them. I definitely wouldn't do it. I'll tell you guys right now that I left Wellington and I went with Kenny. It's my favorite choice because I believe that you can't leave the ones that you love and I'm willing to risk my life if it means spending it with the big Ken. If you choose to leave despite Kenny's begs, he accepts your decision and they leave together into the unknown. Oh, we're leaving. All of us. Together. Claire, please. It's safe here. You need to Stop. think about the- Stop! Okay? We're not staying, so just stop. You're as stubborn as a damn mule. Yeah? Wonder where I got that from. Again, this is my favorite ending because I've always liked Kenny, and I know that he'll protect Clem and AJ the best he can. Now let's see what happens if you stay in Wellington. Kenny leaves his hat behind for AJ, and he walks away into the distance alone while Clem starts a new life in Wellington. Here, here. When he, when he's old enough, you make him wear it. It'll, it'll keep the sun out of his eyes. That's important. Now, I'm gonna walk away, and I might not look back. Not because I don't want to. I'm real glad to have met you, Clementine. This has to be the saddest ending. Kenny wants them safe so badly and cares for them so much, and he's willing to leave the people he loves as long as he knows that they'll be okay. I think that the best ending is staying at Wellington because it actually makes the most sense, but my favorite is still leaving with Kenny. Alright, that's all of the endings. 
let me know which one you got and which one is your favorite in the comments. I'm really curious to see if anyone actually likes the endings that don't involve Kenny. The Kenny endings almost make me as sad as the first game's endings, so I'd love to talk about it more, but I think it's time to move on to the conclusion for this video. The Walking Dead Season 2 is a worthy follow-up to the first game. Following up on a game that was incredible and influential isn't easy, especially when a lot of people that worked on that first game didn't work on the second one. This game turned out awesome, and I love that they tried different things instead of repeating what happened in the first game. For this game's theme, I don't think it's as cut and dry as the first game, but I do think there are some things that we can pull out of it. I believe that this game is trying to remind the player to surround themselves with the people that they want to be around. The whole game is about Clementine having to be with people because she can't be all alone, but slowly throughout the game she gets more and more capable. She learns how to make walkers easier to kill, she gets better at shooting, everything that happens prepares her to finally choose who she wants to be with. This all culminates into the final choice, Kenny or Jane, and which you get to choose the people that you'll be surviving with. If you really believe it's right, you can leave without being with anybody but you and AJ, and even though your odds are unlikely, it's an adult decision that Clem is giving herself the authority to make. Let's talk about a complaint a lot of people have with this game. Why did the characters make the 11 year old do all of the work? There's a pretty simple answer to this, she's the protagonist. How boring would it be if you had to steal walkie talkie and Nick comes up and he's like, don't worry guys, I'll do it, and then he comes back with the walkie talkie. As unrealistic as it may be, the protagonist has to do things so that the game is interesting to the player. Another potential problem in this game is the amount of characters. There are so many here and it doesn't allow adequate time for character development with each character. Some characters do a complete 180, like Rebecca going from as mean as can be to super nice to Clementine with nothing prompting it. There are some good things about the amount of characters, and that's the amount of deaths that they can squeeze into the game. This may be a problem for some people, but I think it's super cool having a lot of characters that slowly die off until there's only a few people left. Speaking of death, this game is pretty dark compared to the first one. A lot of people will agree that this game beats the player down a little bit too much, and there are hardly any moments where it feels like things are going right. I think the ski lodge and the night in the power generators are the only time that things felt like they were alright, while in the first game you had the extended stay at the motel, the St. John's Dairy, and the mansion, all locations that felt secure and made things feel fine for a time being. This game is a lot more movement focused. The group is constantly moving to escape Carver, and once they get out of his camp they're moving just to survive, and that brings up another issue which is the lack of hope. Even the developers mention this in the developer commentary for the season, it's lacking a goal other than surviving. In the first season, they were trying to find a boat for most of the game, then eventually trying to find Clementine, and there was always a goal of keeping Clem safe with the hope of finding a safe haven. In this game, the group is so survival focused that they never get the opportunity to have a goal. The amount of death and beating that the group endures can be pretty depressing, it hardly ever feels like good things are happening to the group. I will say though, I kinda like it. Like I said earlier, the devs didn't want to go easy on Clementine, and I think this season was the best way they could get Clem to fully grow up. In my opinion, by the end of the game, Clem has gained a few years of experience just in the few weeks that this game takes place. This terrible section of her life has hardened her, and I like how the game provides this natural progression. The game does a great job of making you feel like you're in the shoes of Clementine, with people constantly underestimating you and the sassy remarks it allows you to respond with. The dialogue options throughout this game are awesome. They feel natural and sometimes downright cold. The switch to Clementine as a player character was genius. It's the natural next step after Lee, and it's such an interesting way to switch things up. Of course, I can't not talk about Kenny. I don't think this game would have been anywhere near as good if Kenny wasn't in it. He was an excellent addition, and it created this constant dynamic of covering for him while also thinking that he may be going too far. I'll even admit that Kenny does some messed up stuff, and he is kinda crazy, but at the end of the day, his goal is to protect Clementine and AJ no matter the cost, and I can get behind that. Does he make everything more complicated? Yes. Is he hilarious? Yes. Is he freaking awesome? Yes. He literally added so much to this game, and Gavin Hammond nails his performance in every way. For the villains, Carver is absolutely excellent. He has a complete disregard for people's wants, and instead he just fulfills human needs by keeping people alive, but you can't force people to do things without a revolt. Arvo and the Russians aren't nearly as great of villains, but I like to think that by the fifth episode the villain is the group itself falling apart. Jane and Kenny have heavily conflicting personalities, so it makes sense that the final battle would be between the two. Both Jane and Kenny want to allow Clementine to become capable, and I do believe that either of them is a decent choice, however there does seem to be a bias from the developers towards Kenny. They gave Kenny a huge heartfelt ending that felt very climactic and sad, 
while Jane's ending was kind of a letdown with no real feeling behind it. Not that I'm complaining, I'm Team Kenny all the way. By the end of the game, your choices have molded Clementine into the person that you wanted her to be. Her maturity, how hardened she is, it all depends on you as the player, and now you get to watch her end one chapter in her life and start another. Alright guys, you know the drill. Just like last time, this is my post-editing final thoughts on this video. Um, obviously, I just want to thank you guys so much for the support on the first one. Uh, it's at almost 15,000 views right now when I'm recording this. Um, and that's just ridiculous. So, I wanted to thank you guys so much for that. And also, I want to talk about the future of what's going to be on this channel. So... Obviously, I really like doing these game reviews, and I'd love to do more, and I think the next one's gonna be The Last of Us. But, I just wanna let you guys know now, this is not the only thing that I do. I'm not all The Walking Dead, I'm not all The Last of Us, I'm not only zombie games in general, you know? So, while I love these games, I also love other games, so... And I understand that most of you guys are probably here because you like The Walking Dead, but just know that I like other games and I'm so down to do any other games that's not the only thing I do and um in the at the end of the day um I don't just want to be the walking dead guy despite how much I love the games um so yeah if you guys have any games suggestions that you want me to do a video on just let me know in the comments and I would be so down I'm thinking Titanfall 2 Jedi Fallen Order there's a lot of games that I could do a, a video on, and some of them might be shorter since they're not as story focused as The Walking Dead is, but I mean, that's okay. I mean, we can we can try things out. Um, also, I want to just talk about like this new series title, why I love. The reason I'm changing it to this is so that they're all consistent with each other. Um, so the series will be the why I love series retrospective or whatever. So yeah, I think that it'll work out pretty well. Um, I guess I don't want to ramble on too long here. I don't really have anything else to say. So again, just thank you guys so much for all the support. I really hope you enjoyed the video. I like this game almost as much as the first one. Uh, I guess I'll mention right now that my order for the Walking Dead games is definitely the first game, fourth game, second game, third game. Um, so... I'm not exactly ecstatic to do the third game because I feel like I would have less to say about it since I don't quite like it as much, but I still like it. So maybe I'll start a why I like series, who knows? But yeah, so looks like the next one's gonna be The Last of Us. It might take a couple months or a month or so again. Uh, just depends on when I get started on it. Um, but yeah, after that, Titanfall 2, Jedi Fallen Order, anything like that, just let me know in the comments, guys. Alright, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.